All right. Good evening, everyone. Good to see you here. Several weeks ago, I saw a video on Facebook that someone put up, and it was Emma Jean and Amira singing Amazing Grace. And I thought at that time, I think I'd like to have them do that on our Tuesday night service. And so we're going to have Emma Jean and Amira come up. You come up, girls, and they're going to sing Amazing Grace for us tonight, okay? Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas Take your Bible this evening, if you would, and go to Acts chapter 9. Would you do that, please? Acts chapter 9. We'll take just a, just a few minutes this evening. Just want to share something with you about the early church and Jerusalem. Acts chapter 9. Acts 9, and look with me at verse number 32. The Bible says it came to pass as Peter passed throughout all quarters... He came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. And all that dwelt at Lystra and Saron saw him and turned to the Lord. Now there was at Joppa, a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. And for as much as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them, when he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed, and turning him to the body said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up, and when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon, a tanner. Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer as, Lord, we want to take just a few moments this evening and look into your word and receive something from the word of God tonight. We have enjoyed the service, Lord, and we enjoy giving thanks for our fellow laborers and all of us serving in your vineyard. Father, thank you for faithful people who serve faithfully here through Bible Baptist Church. Now, Father, I pray that you'll turn our attention to your word this evening and that we'll, we'll be what this church was in, the, in Jerusalem here in the book of Acts. As they had a heart to help and a heart for others. 
that will have that same kind of heart as our church. So speak to us this evening as we share these thoughts. Help us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm glad I'm in church, aren't you? And the church doesn't have to be drudgery. Uh, you know, when you go to church as often as I do, you, you better learn to enjoy it. And uh, so you don't have to endure it, you can enjoy it. And something we look forward to, I think, and I look forward to the services, and I look forward to this service particularly every year. This early church of Jerusalem was an amazing church, and uh, you know, it started with uh, the first day of Pentecost when 3,000 were saved and baptized and added to the church, and uh, that was phenomenal in itself, but it wasn't long after that till 5,000 more were added to the church, and uh, then, then believers, they didn't even count the number, they just said they were multiplied uh, to the church, and historians is what we have to go by, and uh, they vary in range of the number of people in this church. Uh, they vary anywhere from 25,000 to upwards of 60,000, uh, just within about six months' time. Uh, that's pretty good church growth, you know? And uh, you say, well, what kind of building do they have? They didn't have one. Uh, they just met it wherever they could in groups and houses and wherever they could gather together. But, but I want you to, I think what God did here in Acts 9 was to show us something about this early church. And that is, while they had great numbers and while they were reaching great numbers of people, they still had a heart for individuals. And I think it's important that a church never lose sight of the fact that we're, we're in this to have a heart for people. Sometimes it's so easy for churches to get very machine-like and become very mechanical. And, and it's just a business, you know. And, but this is God's business. And God's business is people. And He loves people. And so this is a church that, that has a heart. And, and I think that God is developing that in us at Bible Baptist Church. To be a church that has a heart. And there's three things that I think this church had a heart for I want to share with you just briefly tonight. Number one, I see this early church had a heart for human beings, for humans. They cared about individuals. Notice here in verse 32, Peter is mentioned. And God's doing a work in Peter's heart. Up till now, Peter's been thinking that the Gospel is just for the Jew, not for the Gentile. This little city that's mentioned here, Lydda, is about 25 miles from Jerusalem and it's primarily a Gentile city which wouldn't sit well with Peter. But God is beginning to break down the walls of prejudice in Peter's heart. Now He's going to do that completely in the next chapter, in Acts chapter 10, when he has the vision to go see Cornelius. But he's, he's learning what Paul said later in Galatians 3 that in Christ there's neither Greek nor Jew nor Greek, there's bond nor free, there's neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. And, and you know, we learn that no matter what you are out there, when you cross the threshold of the church, all the ground's level right here, okay? And uh, you may be big shot out there, but we're just all little shots in here, okay? And uh, we're just brother and sister, and we're, we're all one in Christ as we serve the Lord. And so it mentions in fellow here named Aeneas. Aeneas had been crippled for eight years. And Peter said to him in verse 34, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole, arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. Some of you parents ought to memorize that verse and quote it to your teenagers. <laughs> arise and make thy bed. That would be a good one for them to learn. But, but here, God is allowing this man... Why, why, would, why would God insert this little portion right here to tell us that Aeneas was healed. I think that God is letting us know in the midst of thousands of people coming to Christ that, that He's still concerned about individuals. He's still concerned about a human being, a real man with a real need, and God met that need. God meets the needs of individuals. God cares about individuals. And all through this passage, you see Peter, you see Aeneas. The next person that he points out by name is somebody named Tabitha, or as they called her, Dorcas. I probably would prefer Tabitha. But they, they called her Dorcas. And 
this was amazing, uh, incredible faith on part of the apostles. Dorcas was, did many great things for them. She was a seamstress and she sewed things for them and provided for them and Dorcas died. And, and when she died, they sent for Peter. And, and Peter came and, and uh, by his, uh, up until this point, you understand, no apostle had ever raised anybody from the dead. Only Jesus did that. This is the first time that an apostle would exercise enough faith to raise somebody from the dead. And not only, I think, Peter's faith, though Peter, Peter never lacked for one to have faith. You know, when Jesus walked on the water, Peter said, hey Lord, if that's you, I'm coming. I want to walk on the water too. None of the other eleven, as far as we know, said anything. They weren't fighting to jump out of the boat and walk on the water to Jesus. Peter didn't have any competition. Nobody was pulling him back trying to climb over him, you know. They might have been the other way, helping him out. I don't know. But it was a tremendous faith here, and he believed that Christ could raise her from the dead. And he did. And again, I think it's just God telling us he cares about individuals. Don't, don't get so caught up that, well, look at the people. Look at the, all the folks that are serving. Look at the crowds. Look at the... No, 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 no. Let's not forget God loves individuals. God loves people. Human beings. We see it with Peter. We see it with Ananias. We see it with Tabitha or Dorcas. And then down in verse 43, he says something else. It came to pass at the very last verse. Notice it says, he, that was Peter, he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon a tanner. Again, there's just a, a verse that seemingly is just, okay, that's just nice to know. But, but there's something there for us to learn. Simon, a tanner. He tanned the hides of animals. He would be in our day and age a taxidermist. Somebody who takes those uh, skinned dead animals and he would skin the dead animals and tan their hide. Now, why, why would God put that in there except the fact we know Peter would never stay with somebody like that? That would be a guy who had unclean animals around. And Peter wouldn't associate with someone like that. He'd been ceremonially unclean. It wasn't kosher for him to work around the dead animals. Okay, And so God's moving Peter away from that, those bonds of Jewish legalism, so to speak, and a, and a step towards freedom and grace and preaching the gospel to all men. And so God uses a real man with a real name, with a real need, with a real job to get to the heart of the Apostle Peter. And so we know that God cares about individuals. And listen, we live in a very impersonal age. Okay? To our government, we're a number. To your bank, you're an account. When you come up to the bank, they, they want to know what your account number is. If they go up to the ATM, what's your PIN number? Not enough to tell them your name. That isn't going to work. In fact, you go to a website, they want your username and your password. What's your password? I'm glad that God sees me as an individual. I'm glad that God says He calls us by name. God knows our name. In fact, He says, I, I know my sheep and I know of mine, and He calls by name. In fact, He says, the very hairs of our head are numbered. God keeps track of even the number of hairs on our head. For some He adds, and for some He subtracts. But He knows how many are there. He knows. He's concerned about the details of our life. You know, God, listen, if we're a church with a heart, we have to understand there's people out there. And don't just look at the tens of thousands of people. Every one of them are individuals. And every one of them have needs. Every one of them have needs. No doubt in this area. In this greater area, just, just within five or ten miles of our church. I'll guarantee you, just this week, some child found out their mom and dad are going to divorce. I would guarantee you that just this week, somebody found out that they lost their job. 
I'll guarantee you that just this week, some parent just found out their child is addicted to drugs. They need, they need to find a church that will love them where they are and have a heart for them where they are and lovingly bring them to where they need to be. That's loving individuals. Realizing when, when someone doesn't talk to you or someone doesn't speak to you or someone is uh, seeming to, to, to be mean to you, don't you say, huh, what's that guy's problem? Huh? Instead of saying, I wonder what is his problem. I wonder what is going on in his life. Hmm? And sometimes you just take somebody to break through that barrier, that defense, and say, hey man, everything okay? Sometimes it just takes a Christian to say, you know what, I'm a Christian. Is there anything I could pray for you about? Boy, you'd be surprised how people will open up to you because you'll pray for them. Okay? Care for humans. The second thing I see is here, the church, this church also had a heart for helping. Not just a heart for humans, but a heart for helping. Tabitha, who we read about earlier, was full of good works and alms deeds, which means what she gave to the poor. Alms deed is giving to the poor. And so she made her clothing not to sell. She made her clothing to give away to people who couldn't afford it. And so she made clothes and coats for people in the church. Uh, she was apparently a pretty good seamstress. So she used her talents and her abilities for others. And God gives all of us talents and abilities. He gives all of us spiritual gifts, if you will. I bought a paper clip tonight. Aren't paper clips amazing? Huh? You never thought about a paper clip, have you? Paper clips. I mean, they can hold they can hold thick sermons together. This isn't one, by the way. This is a paper clip, it's not a thick sermon, okay? This is uh it it'll it, it's not a lot of metal in it, but it sure can do some wonderful things. Because it's not a matter of the amount of the metal, it's the way in which it's bent. And it doesn't matter you don't have the flashiest abilities. It doesn't matter you don't have the, a multitude of gifts. It matters the way you use them. The way you're bent. Will you use them for others and not use them for yourself? Use them to be a benefit to somebody else and not to promote yourself? How are you bent? Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth nor fame. There's a prize and you can win it. If you'll go in Jesus' name. I think we have many people here that use their gifts and abilities for God's glory. You saw some of them tonight as we recognize the different groups. It's... it's and by the way, unless you think we got a lot of folks, you know what, can I, can I tell you something? There's room for more. There's room for more. Now, many of those folks, if you noticed, many of these folks are in three and four different ministries, wearing three and four different hats. Well, they wouldn't have to do three and four different things if we had more people doing what God wanted them to do. Then you don't have to spread yourself out so much. But use it to help others. The body of Christ, the church of Christ, functioning well together because they have a heart to serve others. A heart for helping one another. So a church, if we're going to be the church with the heart and we're going to make ourselves like this church, we have a heart for humans, we have a heart for helping, and then the last thing is, we have a heart for heaven. We have a heart for heaven. There's two miracles in the passage that we read in Acts 9. The healing of Aeneas from eight years being crippled on his bed to the raising of Tabitha or Dorcas from the dead. But notice the results of both miracles. When Aeneas was healed, when he said, make, Arise, make thy bed, and he rose immediately. Verse 35, All that dwelled at Lydda and Saren saw him and did what? Turn to the Lord. And people got saved. When Tabitha got raised from the dead, when, he, when Peter presented her alive in verse 41, verse 42 says, It was known throughout all Joppa, and many 
believed in the Lord. People saw what the church was doing and they believed in the Lord. They got saved because of what they saw going on in the church. When, when they see that God heals people, and God does, God hasn't changed. We don't believe in divine healers. Okay? You call 1 800 Benny Hinn all you want, I'm not going to call him. Okay? We don't believe in divine healers, we believe in divine healing. God is the divine healer. And God can heal folks. I believe that he, re- he reached down and he touched John's heart and calmed that thing down. And they didn't have to put any electricity on. Okay? Is God able to do that? God's able to do that. See, God can heal people. When they hear things like that, it's, it's, it's the idea that God answers our prayer, that God hears our prayers, and you know what? That ought to turn people to God and say, I'd like to have that kind of relationship. I'd like to know God in that way. In the New Testament, we read about numbers of people that Jesus healed. But it doesn't mean they never died. People still die. And that's what I want us to focus on for a minute. Remember, no matter how many people we help, have a heart for humans, have a heart for helping, we have to understand we can help them with their physical needs. We can pray for them. We can invest in them. But always, always in our minds, we have to remember they're going to die and spend eternity somewhere. And I don't want to feed their, feed their stomach and take care of their physical needs and let them die and go to hell healthy. I want to be able to help them and feed them and clothe them and do what we can for them and, uh, with the bag of hope or whatever it may be. Uh, but listen, huh, I want to make sure they get the gospel. Make sure the bottom line is we have a heart for heaven. That no, Listen, no one who's going to heaven is content to go there alone. One of the sure signs that you're saved and you have eternal life is you don't want to go to heaven by yourself. All the right away you're concerned about loved ones. And and I was only a six year old boy when I got saved, and and right away I was concerned about my neighbors. And we had a Spicer family live next door to us, and they had three boys, and we hung out together, and 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 right away I was concerned about those guys. Are they saved? Started to witness to them and got them to come to church and and those boys made a profession of faith in Christ. I was concerned about that, and that is because I knew I had something. I wanted them to have it too. You can't just have a heart for helping. You have to have a heart for heaven. If it's not supernatural help we're giving them, it's just superficial help we're giving them. We're not trying to make the world a better place to go to hell from. We're trying to reach them with the gospel. Of Jesus Christ. If I can get, we can get somebody off drugs, that's great. But their main need is Jesus Christ. Their main need is Jesus Christ. I was adding up today, so far this year, in the RU Inside Ministry, and of course we still have several weeks to go, we've seen 459 men receive Christ as their Savior in the RU Ministry so far. That's the RU Inside Ministry. I'm glad that at times we can take food and try to meet somebody's temporary need. But we have to also take the gospel and meet their most important need. And that is sharing the Lord Jesus Christ with them. Don't just view the person with a flat tire as someone who needs help with a tire. He may need help with his soul. Don't just view the person at... At, at, at Walmart struggling with some bags. Don't you say, oh, that's somebody who needs help getting their stuff loaded. No, that may be somebody who needs to hear about Jesus. And by you putting some groceries in their car, you could tell them about their greatest need. We don't just have a funeral service and share a meal. We give the gospel. And, and the best we could tell this morning, five people looked at me and said they would receive Christ as their Savior. That's, that's what it's about. I'll guarantee you that's what Norbell would be about. Wanting to make sure they got the gospel. We meet people every single week that are going to die. The recent shooting in Chicago now. I think the police officer that 
was killed there had just gotten out of training. First assignment by himself. And he's in eternity. Brother Mike shared with me during handshaking as a friend that was tragically killed. He had no idea that was going to be his last day on earth. We don't know. We do not know. Everybody we meet is going to spend eternity somewhere. People who aren't in the hospital, they're not on their deathbed. They're just living and breathing and yet the clock is ticking. And we don't know it. We have to help them with their greatest need. And their greatest need is to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Amen? Let's not lose the focus. Help them with their needs. So if we're going to have a if we're going to be a, a church with a heart like the church at Jerusalem, then we have to have a heart for human beings, for individuals. We have to have a heart to help. Let's, let's use the talents and abilities and the gifts that God gives us to serve others. But we have to remember, ultimately, we have to have a heart for heaven. To make sure we tell folks how they can know they're on their way to heaven. You know, if you ask most people, do you, do you know if you died today, are you 100% sure you'd go to heaven? Most people have never been asked that question. And most people think there's no way anybody can know for sure. Well, there is a way you can know for sure. And we've got to be ready to tell people that. So let's be a church that has a heart for humans, for individuals, for helping others, and for heaven. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege to look into your word tonight. Thank you for our church. Lord, I'm thankful that you're developing in us a heart. A heart for individuals. A heart, Lord, to help others. A heart, God, for heaven. I pray, Lord, that you would develop that in us. That, Lord, if the community in our area here would know anything about Bible Baptist Church, I pray they would know they'll, they'll love you over there. They'll help you over there. They'll tell you about heaven over there. Give us that kind of a testimony, Lord, for your glory and your honor. Lord, now... We pray your blessing as we prepare to go. Pray you'll bless our church family. Some may be traveling over the holiday. Some will have family members and relatives traveling to see them. I pray you'd watch over them over the highway, Lord. Already heard of this wreck tonight on 270 that closes the highway. Lord, put a hedge of protection around our folks and watch over them. Lord, get everyone safely to their destination and then safely back home. And if you tear your coming, Lord, bring us back together for the Lord's Day on Sunday. And we'll thank you for that. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.